Welcome, and thank you for logging on for this School Nurse Professional Development Online Training. Highmark Foundation, in collaboration with Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center, is pleased to offer this professional development opportunity for school nurses. Between fall of 2015 and fall of 2016, this collaborative effort will result in five online professional development trainings utilizing physician experts to address select topics identified by school nurses. This first training in the series focuses on dermatology. Future topics will include mental health, depression, anxiety, and medications coming in November of 2015, diabetes coming in March of 2016, asthma and allergies coming in May of 2016, and common food allergies coming in October of 2016. My name is Allison Lipset simpson and, and I'm the Education Program Associate for Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center. Joining me is Nathan Oxenford from the Penn State Miltness Hershey Medical Center. Nathan is a certified pediatric nurse practitioner in primary care. He holds a Master of Arts degree in bioethics and a Master of Science degree in nursing from Case Western Reserve University. Penn State Milton S. Hershey Medical Center's Department of Dermatology has recently collaborated with Academic General Pediatrics to improve patient access for those needing specialty dermatologic services. Nathan works at, Penn, at the Pediatric Dermatology Clinic under the direct supervision of Penn State Hershey's pediatric dermatologist, Dr. Andrea Zangline. A bit of information about the Penn State Hershey Pro Wellness Center. The center is committed to educating and inspiring youth and their families to eat well, engage in regular physical activity, and become champions for bringing healthy choices to life. We aim to be the trusted resource for educational programming, collaborative partnerships, and proven interventions in schools, communities, and like-minded organizations. In 2014, we worked with over 400 schools in some capacity, and we pride ourselves on being a great resource for schools and their partners. The PRO in our name stands for Prevention, Research, and Outreach. Examples of our work based on this acronym can be found on our website. Also on our website, we have many resources, including the opportunity to sign up your school or community-based organization to be a Healthy Champion. Our Healthy Champions program includes resources like annual, um, like event planning guides and promotional templates, customized school champion reports, and future funding priority. Annual, annual registration is required to receive your welcome kit at the beginning of each school year, and registration begins each spring. There's no limit on how many schools or community-based organizations can enroll, but the welcome kits are limited. So log on to our website to read more details about the program. Part of the kit that you would receive as a Healthy Champion would include posters for our four signature events, including walk to and at school day, go for the green, and apple crunch, Move it outside day. So I'd like to take a moment to thank Nathan Oxenford for participating with us on this web series. Thank you for being with us, Nathan. Thank you, Ali, for this opportunity to come speak with you today about rashes and for letting me droll on for about an hour or so. To begin today's talk, I'd like to emphasize that rashes in the school setting for nurses are particularly important because of determining whether a child should be able to stay at school or should go home from school. It's a particularly susceptible population because of the close proximity and often, uh, let's say, less than optimal hygiene measures on the part of the child. It's not uncommon for school nurses to also be the first-line providers with a new onset of a rash and have to determine whether the rash is benign or worrisome. As such, when a child presents with a rash, a thorough history should be taken, including determination of onset, the location, the evolution, any possible irritant exposures, uh, contagious symptoms, or other systemic complaints. Ultimately, you're kind of charged with answering the question that the British rock band The Clash coined, should I stay or should I go? For our lecture today, the objectives will be to identify common rashes found in school-aged children. These may include bacterial, viral, fungal, or infestations or infections, and to also understand the expected clinical course, appropriate treatment options, and implication of each rash as it relates to school attendance. 
While I will suggest to you best practices regarding school attendance, I do not claim to have any authority over you or your institution, and you should of course follow institutional guidelines when determining if school attendance is appropriate for each individual child on a case-to-case -case basis. Let's begin with a few bacterial infections. The first I'd like to talk about is impetigo, which is a superficial skin infection of the epidermis commonly caused by Staph aureus group A beta hemolytic strep or both. It affects primarily infants and young children and contributing factors include minor trauma and insect bites. Staph reservoirs in children can include the nares where strep tends to spread from skin to skin. Colonization can also occur via a filamentous adhesin, which attaches to different host cell receptors differently. This accounts for the differences in affinity of microflora at specific sites on the body. For example, isolates of group A beta hemolytic strep from the skin are typically more adherent to skin epithelium as opposed to the mucosal surface receptors of the oropharynx which clinically manifest as strep throat. Examination reveals two things. There's a non-bolus and a bolus presentation of impetigo. The non-bolus, which is seen at left, starts as smaller papillaries or pustules, which may evolve into thin-walled vesicles, which rupture and produce the classic appearance of a quote-unquote honey-colored crust. So if you look at the slide at left, what you see is several lesions. You see some small papules, a few little vesicles there, but what you'll discover is when they erode, you have that kind of honeyish appearance as, all, as almost this kiddo took a little honey and smeared it around his face. And that's classic for non-bolus impetigo. Another interesting finding is lymphadenopathy, which is found in almost 90% of the cases. This presentation of non-bolus impetigo coupled with lymphadenopathy accounts for the majority of cases of impetigo. Bolus impetigo is a little bit different. So this starts as papules, evolves into vesicles, and then kind of into thin-walled bulla with a clear to purulent fluid which can rupture giving a shallow ulcer appearance. So if you look at left, again, you'll see kind of two examples. You see one bulla there, and then above that you see actual the ulcerated version of a ruptured bulla. The majority of bullous cases are caused by Staph aureus, which produces an exfoliative toxin. In contrast to non-bullous disease, regional lymphadenopathy is usually absent, and this presentation can be thought of almost like a localized staph scalded skin syndrome. Tests include culture to see what the organism is exactly. And then management of impetigo is usually topical antibiotics for local disease. And it's important to note that topical antibiotics may be as effective as oral antibiotics for limited disease. Localized lesions can be managed with a medication such as mupirocin or Bactroban ointment three times a day for 10 days. If you have multiple lesions, which some sources define as greater than three, you can use a first-line antibiotic such as Caflex or cephalexin, which may help. It may also be important to decrease the burden of Staph aureus in the nares, especially in recurrent cases. And you should consider applying the same mupirocin ointment that you would use for the body intranasally with a Q-tip just to the lower part of the nose. Prevention includes washing linens, towels, and obviously good hand hygiene. And complications can include deeper infection or if the organism is strep, occasionally a post-strep glomerulonephritis. Special considerations in this case should include athletes who should not return to sports until there are no open lesions. Moving forward, a second common bacterial infection you've probably all seen in the past is folliculitis. Folliculitis is an inflammation of the hair follicle, usually caused by staph or strep again. On examination, you typically see yellow to white papules with a base of erythema at the base of the hair shaft. So I pictured at left again, you see multiple small pustules, a few red papules, but you'll notice the erythema surrounding and that they're 
isolated to the areas of hair. They commonly are seen on the buttocks of children and are usually non-painful, but occasionally are associated with itch. There are no particular tests, but culture can be helpful. And management inc includes an appropriate topical antibiotic in some cases, cleansing twice daily with an antimicrobial soap, and also dilute bleach baths can be very helpful in decreasing colonization of the skin. One way this can be done is using a quarter cup of bleach to a half tub of water and having this child soak 20 minutes twice per week. Lookalike considerations sh should include keratosis pilaris, which is just essentially follicular plugging that does not have the same erythematous base and is typically seen on the back of the arms, the legs, and sometimes the cheeks bilaterally. Eczema is the next infection we're going to talk about. And really, this is a deeper infection into the dermis by staph strep or other multiple organisms. Examination, you'll see a pustule evolving to a vesicle with an erythematous base and an adherent crust. And when you kind of remove the crust or unroof it, what you see is a deep ulcerative appearance that looks more punched out. It affects all ages. Man or excuse me, testing again includes culture. And management usually includes a beta-lactamase resistant penicillin or a first generation cephalosporin. So whereas impetigo could be treated with topicals, if you have eczema or you're suspected of having something that looks similar to this with that deeper appearance and punched out appearance, you should probably be on an oral antibiotic at that point. Complications can include cellulitis, scarlet fever, again, if the organism is strep or glomerulonephritis. So let's talk about MRSA. So what does MRSA mean? Well, as you all know, it's methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. And it's a genetically altered organism with an altered penicillin protein binding site, PB2A, which protects it from beta-lactam antibiotics that target the bacterial cell wall synthesis. The altered PBP2A results from a genetic alteration within the staphylococcal cassette chromosome, MEC, which is responsible for its production. Other virulence factors noted are the panton valentine leukocytin, which destroy leukocytes and cause tissue necrosis, as well as efflux pumps and ribo ribosomal alterations, which can make them resistant to antibiotics such as macrolides as well as clindamycin. On examination, the most common presentation is furunculosis, or a boil. But may, this may also present as an abscess, cellulitis, or deeper necrotic plaque. So what's the difference between furunculosis and an abscess? Well, furunculosis refers to an hair infection, or an infection of the hair follicle, where an abscess can occur anywhere on the body. Testing includes culture as a gold standard for purposes of uh, obtaining susceptibilities because patterns of MRSA and susceptibilities vary broadly within communities. And an antibiogram through your local hospital or health department is often also very helpful. Community acquired, which stands for the CA that you're seeing on the slide here, MRSA, is usually susceptible to non-beta-lactam antibiotics. Hospital acquired, which is noted as HA on the slide here, is usually multi-drug resistant. Treatment options. Well, the pharmacological options are based on susceptibilities, but often this is going to use a non-beta-lactam antibiotic plus a topical antibiotic. Incision and drainage may also be very helpful at improving the clinical course. And in my experience, most of the susceptibilities in this direct area have been susceptible to Bactrim, which I prefer over clindamycin in children. Again, dilute bleach baths using a quarter cup of bleach and a half tub of water, soaking for 20 minutes twice a week can be very helpful with bacterial co colonization. And warm compresses may help facilitate drainage, even if 
and incision and drainage hasn't been performed. Treating the nose to decrease the bacterial burden of Staph aureus in the nose is also, again, a helpful consideration. Prevention includes washing linens, towels, and good hand hygiene. Complications include widespread systemic infection. And special consideration, again, should be athletes should have no open lesions before returning to sports. So like the clash, when we ask ourselves, should I stay or should I go, in regard to impetigo, eczema, and MRSA, the answer is definitely go home. They're contagious. Transmission is by direct contact, however, and kids may return to school after initiation of antibiotics, considering to keep open or weeping areas covered. Special considerations in all these should include athletes who should not have any open lesions before returning to sports. In the case of folliculitis, it's not a big deal. Kids should stay at school. Moving forward, let's next discuss the classic exanthems. But before getting ahead of ourselves, let's have some clarity in terminology. So what is an exanthem and exactly how is this different from the other word you'll hear, which is an enanthem, E-A-N-A-N-T-H-E-M. So by definition, an exanthem comes from the Greek, which means out of, into bloom, or a breaking out. So this refers to a cutaneous eruption that appears abruptly. An enanthem, which is almost identically spelled, just starts with en, is from the Greek meaning in, instead of, out of, also to bloom, referring to a mucous membrane eruption. So just to be clear, exanthem, we're talking about the skin, and anthem, we're talking about the mucous membranes. Unfortunately, to most of our eyes, the exanthems, the skin, are going to look extremely similar. And that's why history becomes so vitally important in determining your next course of action. The particular exanthems we're going to discuss are as follows, historically named in this order, four of which are viral. The six classic infectious exanthems with numerical designation include measles, Number two, scarlet fever. Number three, rubella, also known as German measles or three days measles. Number four is a disease which I'm, is not a distinct entity and is really not recognized individually anymore, so we're not going to speak of it, but there it is. Number five, erythema infectiosum, also very well known as slap cheek disease or fifth disease. So hopefully the naming there, and you say, oh, why is fifth disease named fifth disease? Well, it's the order it was discovered. And the last one, roseola, also known as sixth disease, again, being sixth disease because that was the order it was discovered. No, nothing groundbreaking there. Others we're going to talk about briefly are hand, foot, and mouth, as well as the ever popular chicken pox or varicella. The first, rubiola, also known as measles, is a disease which in the pre-vaccine era, talking 1963-ish or so, there were about 500,000 cases and about 495 deaths in the U.S. annually. And this is pretty remarkable given that most were still unreported. In 2000, the measles was declared eliminated in the U.S. In 2004, uh, it escalated and there were about 37 cases reported. And in 2014, there were about 668 cases reported. And to my knowledge, in 2015, I think there has always, already been one measles-related death. The cause of measles is a single-stranded RNA virus. Transmission is droplet or airborne. And the scary thing is it can remain in the air for up to two hours. And as many as nine out of 10 susceptible people with close contact will get the measles. So this is concerning to me as a person who spent some time in primary care, because I think of all my little kiddos under one year old who haven't had their MMR vaccine, and if nine out of 10 of them were in the same airspace with someone with measles, I'm very worried about them getting infected. It's also contagious four days before and up to four days after the presence of the rash. What you'd see on any examination or test is a classic history of what people will term the three C's, which are cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis. With a rash beginning on about day four, behind or on the face and behind the ears, spreading to the trunk and extremities with mild itching. It affects young preschool aged children. An examination reveals what you would call pink papules with maybe a blotchy, blanchable macule 
was spread in the head-to-toe direction and fading in the order of appearance. One useful way to remember this is it's been described as someone tilting their head back and looking up at the sky and having a paint bucket poured over their head. So that's trying to describe it beginning, you know, around the hairline and forehead and behind the ears and spreading down the body. And then it also fades in that order. Another finding you might see with the measles, if hopefully you'll never see them, but if you do, are white erosions on the buccal mucosa. So if you see the picture at left here, I didn't do a very good job pointing them out, but you'll see a few lesions kind of juxtaposed to the molars there, which would be called coplic spots. Complications of the measles include pneumonia, bronchitis, gastroenteritis, otitis media, myocarditis, and encephalitis. Prevention measures are good and include the measles, mumps, rubella at both 12 months and then a second booster dose at four to six years. You can also give the MMR vaccine or measles monovalent to an exposed individual who's greater than six months old within 72 hours of exposure. And treatment is just symptomatic, usually including isolation, rest, and Tylenol. It's also been suggested that vitamin A may protect the epithelial mucosa lining and decrease diarrhea often associated with measles. To return to our classic question, should I stay or should I go? Obviously this one is, I go home. It's highly condacious. Incubation is 8 to 12 days. It's spread by respiratory droplets and it can be contagious four days before and up to four days after the rash. And like I said, stays around the air space for a couple hours, we think, which makes it a super scary disease. Let's talk about scarlatina, which you'll also hear referred as scarlet fever. It's a bacterial exanthem resulting in a fine sandpaper, quote unquote, like papules, resulting from group A beta helix strep and the production of a streptococcal pyrogenic exotoxin. It affects primarily 6 to 12 year olds, but may be seen as kiddos as young as one, although this is rare. And transmission is respiratory shoot secretions. Sometimes there's a history of prodrome, fever, sore throat, vomiting, and chills for 12, to two, 12 hours to two days. But honestly, I've seen this in kiddos with no history whatsoever, feeling perfectly fine, maybe aside from a fever, and they have this classic rash. Examination, you'll find fine sandpaper quality blanchable papules, which may start in the axilla growing in neck and then begin to generalize on the body. It can also be associated with what people call a strawberry tongue, as well as circumolar power, pastia sign, which is hyperemic lines on the flexor surfaces of the wrist, elbows, and groin. With resolution, you also may have thick disquamination of the skin, especially on the fingers and toes. And if you look at the picture at left there, if you look closely, you'll see some of that desquaminating skin on this child, child's palms. Complications can include rheumatic fever, pneumonia, pericarditis, meningitis, and glomerulonephritis. Testing includes throat cultures or less often ASO titers if you're uncertain. Uh. Prevention is non-existent except for good hand hygiene. In treatment, it usually includes covering group A beta hemolytic strep with something like amoxicillin, a narrow spectrum cephalosporin, or even azithromycin in those kiddos who are penicillin allergies. It's also important to note that scarlatina may resolve spontaneously, but that starting therapy within nine days helps decrease the incidence of rheumatic fever. Going back to our question, should I stay or should I go? The answer is you should go home. Scarlatina is contagious in the same aspect that strep throat is contagious, transmission is respiratory secretions, and kiddos may return to school after 24 hours of initiating an appropriate antibiotic. Moving forward, we're going to talk about rubella which I always get confused with the real measles. So I usually call real measles rubiola and, and 
rubella, the German measles or the three-day measles. In these kiddos, there may be a history of mild disease with fever and rash beginning in the face and spreading trunk and extremities, but this disappears by day three. In children, rash is also often the first symptom in prodrome might not be present at all. The cause is a rubella virus, which is a rubavirus. And in 1964, 1965, there was an epidemic that caused about 12.5 million cases. It affects primarily vaccinated individuals and incubation is about 14 days. Transmission is respiratory, communicability, about five days before and up to about seven days after the onset of the rash. And it's important to note that it's still contagious after the onset of the rash. Examination, if you read from the textbook, would say it's pink macules and papules. And these are probably a little fainter than measles. They don't coalesce as much, but I don't know if any of us would be able to truly tell them apart unless we had seen them before. You can have post-auricular or occipital lymphadenopathy. It may have Forsheimer spots, which are red palatal lesions which are typically there on day one of the rash. Complications include encephalitis, myocarditis, anemia, thrombocytopenia. Congenital rubella syndrome, if pregnant, is also a concern, which can result in fetal death, hearing loss, eye heart defects, developmental delays, and others. Prevention is, again, the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccination. Treatments are supportive, and education is very important here as the child should not go to school seven days after the onset of rash and should stay away from any pregnant women. If you really think someone has rubella, should they stay or should they go? Well, they should go home and they should probably stay home for a while. It's contagious, transmission is respiratory secretions, and it's probably not a good idea to have them return to school until seven days after the onset of the rash. Moving forward, this is one you're all probably very likely with and have seen multiple times, and if you haven't, you probably will. Erythema infectiosum, known as human parvovirus B19 or Fifth's disease, is typically a mild viral infection characterized by a rash that has this characteristic flecked cheek appearance. The cause is human parvovirus B19. It affects primarily school-aged children from about 4 to 10 years and is more common in the springtime. Transmission is respiratory droplet, incubation about 4 to 21 days. And the curious thing about this one, it is not infection, infectious after the rash onset, as this is correlated with the clearance of viremia. The history may include one to two weeks of a little viral prodrome, meaning low-grade fevers, chills, maybe some muscle aches, and some sore throat. An examination reveals confluent erythematous edematous plaques on the cheeks resulting in a flat cheek appearance. This is usually followed by this reticular, meaning lacy, maculopapules on the extensor surfaces in the trunk one to four days after the onset of the, the facial rash. And the rash on the trunk is often a little bit itchy. Treatment includes itch control. And after the rash fades, it's important to let people know that it can be reactivated by sun, by bathing in warm water, physical activities. And that this does not mean the rash is back, it just kind of reactivates. Special considerations um, are those with hematologic conditions, as they may be at risk for aplastic crisis, as well as pregnant women. So the risk with pregnant women is during their first half of pregnancy, they may pass this to the fetus and cause fetal hydrops or death from severe anemia. And this occurs sometimes in up to 5% of cases. Answering the question, should I stay or should I go? Erythema infectiosum, once the rash is there, the kiddos should be able to stay at school. So if you don't remember anything from today, it's probably this one. If you have someone who you think has flat cheek, once the rash is there, they're no longer contagious. So let them stay. Transmission is respiratory droplet, but again, you're not just after the rash onset. Moving on, our next rash to discuss is roseola infantum, also known as 
6 disease, typically caused by human herpes virus 6, but is not named because of this. It's named because of the order it was discovered, being number 6 in line. It affects children between the months of 6 and 3 years, with a peak at around 6 to 7 months, and is more common in the spring or fall. Transmission is airborne droplets, and if you take a history, there's a hallmark high fever. What are we talking? 101 to maybe 105, so kind of significantly high for maybe three to five days in an otherwise pretty well appearing infant. Now they may appear a little fussy with the fever, but otherwise these are kind of kids you wouldn't expect to have like 103, 104 fever. And then you get this sudden appearance of a rash kind of one to two days after the fever goes away, which lasts for maybe one to three days. Examination, you will find rose pink macules and papules with characteristic faint halos of blanching beginning on the trunk and spreading to the neck and extremities. And if you take a good look at the picture at left, you see that erythema, and then you see these little halos. It's very, very subtle, but where the, where the kind of the macules and papules are coalesced, you can't notice it, but if you look at some of those on the periphery, you see a little whitish blanching around, and that's classic for roseola. Sometimes you have an enanthem, meaning, you know, a mucous membrane involved red papules on the soft palate and uvula called, I'll mispronounce this, I think it, they're pronounced nagayami spots in about two-thirds of cases. There can be associated sore throat, lymphadenopathy. Complications are rare but can include febrile seizure because of those high fevers again and encephalitis. Treatment supportive and special considerations include those who are immunocompromised who may warrant uh, systemic antivirals. So this one may become a bit of a shocker and it's probably a little controversial. So what do you do with a kiddo who has roseola? Recommendation currently is actually to stay at daycare or school. There's no current recommendation for the exclusion of these kids if they are afebrile. Here's another one I'm sure you're all familiar with, hand, foot, and mouth disease. So. Hand, foot, and mouth disease is a vesicular papular exanthem on the hands and feet and a classic enanthem involving the mouth. It's caused by an enterovirus, which is most often Coxsackie virus A16, but can be caused by others, and is common in the late summer and early fall. The history usually includes a brief prodrome of fever and kind of malaise, and they may have a sore throat, respiratory symptoms, or even GI symptoms. On exam examination, the involvement of the mouth will be the first thing to develop with painful vesicles on the buccal muco mucosa and tongue. And they may also involve the palate, the uvula, the tonsillar pillars, and posterior pharynx. And these erode to form ulcers with a rim of erythema in a yellow to gray coating. The exanthem, the skin stuff, then develops with deep vesiculopapules with gray to white color, which may be oval in shape, three to seven millimeters in size, and surrounded by erythema. It's typically limited to the palms and soles, but may involve lateral surfaces of the hands, feet, buttocks, elbows, knees, and perineum. So if you look closely at the pictures, you'll see these vesicles that are really kind of deep appearing. It almost looks like the kiddo, you know, had a frictional blister or something. But it has that surrounding area of erythema, which is just classic for hand, foot, and mouth disease. It is highly contagious. Transmission is fecal, oral, or even respiratory secretions. So this means it's typically worse than the younger kiddos. And incubation is about three to five days. Treatment measures are supportive and typically involve pain control and hydration. And there's controversy over a commonly used thing which is a combination of viscous Benadryl, lidocaine, and Maalox as a solution. And to get around this, I'd say, gee, just take out the viscous lidocaine, combine Benadryl and Maalox in a one-to-one -one ratio, and you're probably good to go there. So hand, foot, and mouth. Should I stay or should I go? This one might be a little controversial, too, but you should probably go home. It is highly contagious. Again, taking into account what population you're working with, 
because prevention is really hand hygiene and kiddos can return to school after the resolution of lesions. If I were running a daycare, I'd take this with a grain of salt on how ill appearing the kid looked because if the rash persisted for several more days than I would expect, it may not be hand, foot, or mouth, and I might not want to keep them out for that much time. Let's talk about chickenpox. I remember getting chickenpox, you remember getting chickenpox, everyone had chickenpox. So now with the varicella vaccine, this is probably not something that's seen that much in the general population. It's typically a mild illness characterized by generalized pyritic vesicles in multiple stages of healing. By generalized in this case, I mean that most children probably get four to 500 chickenpox and involvement is extensive. The cause is varicella zoster. It affects mostly children under 10 years, and it's spread by droplet or airborne methods and incubates around 14 days. It's communicable two days before and up to seven days after the onset of the rash. It's important to note that it's rarely spread through contact with vesicular fluid, but this is possible. The history includes a prodrome of fever and malaise 24 hours before, and then the development of a pyritic rash, typically beginning on the trunk and mucous membranes, evolving into macules, then papules, and then vesicles over a fairly rapid time period, maybe about six to eight hours, then progressing to the face and the head. Classically, they appear in three crops on three consecutive days, with vesicles crusting over in about four to six days. On examination, I admit this isn't the best picture, you typically find fluid-filled vesicles with an erythematous base described as a dewdrop on a rose petal in multiple stages of healing. Prevention includes the varicella virus vaccine or varicella zoster immunoglobulin given to 70, within 72 to 96 hours-ish of exposure to at-risk individuals. Treatment symptomatic but can include such things as anti-itch relief, calamine lotion, I don't know, a vino bath, Benadryl, Tylenol. Uh, but you may need oral acyclovir if someone's older or if they're on corticosteroids. Complications can include scarring secondary bacterial infections, pneumonias, encephalitis, and others. And special considerations are those older than 12 years, immunocompromised, or with chronic disease. Just to throw out there the warning that everyone used to know, but no aspirin products for people under 12 years of age because there's an association with aspirin products with those with chickenpox of developing RISE syndrome. So what should we do in the case of chickenpox? You should go home. They're highly contagious. They're spread by droplet or airborne fashion. They have a longer incubation period and they're communicable maybe up to seven days after the rash appears. Kids can generally return the school when all when all lesions are crusted over. Let's talk next about one of my favorites, which is molluscum contagiosum. This is a cutaneous pox virus infection, and it's the most common pox virus infection in humans. This family includes such notable others as smallpox, chickenpox, cowpox, and the ever popular monkeypox. It affects primarily young school aged children less than eight. It's transmitted by direct contact and fomites, including towels and sponges. And on examination, you'll find these small, described as waxy, dome shaped, flesh colored papules with an umbilicated core. Over time, they may become a little bit more pink in the umbilication, meaning the kind of that donut shape or that central depression becomes uh, more obvious. Distribution can be the antecubital spaces in the armpits or the popliteal fossa behind the knees. And lesions are often not solitary and exhibit cabinerization, meaning linear configurations usually from scratching and auto inoculation. It's important to note that in the adult population, molluscum is frequently associated with sexually transmitted disease, and sometimes HIV infection. However, in, ch in childhood disease, there's typically not this association. In fact, 
the growing genitals, perianal area can often be involved and they do not in and of itself indicate abuse and are usually transmitted in a non-sexual fashion. So while you should ask the appropriate questions, don't jump right into this is a case of sexual abuse. In immunocompetent children, those with an intact immune system, individual lesions resolve typically within about six to nine months, but last up to two years. They usually don't scar, but may leave some small petting scars, which are similar to those of the chickenpox virus. And fortunately, inflammation of the lesions all at once can actually indicate a host immune response. Sometimes you get secondary crusting, which is usually from kiddos scratching and then getting secondarily infected with staph, staph or strep, and you'll see them on a topical antibiotic. Again, not because of the molluscum itself, but because they got secondarily infected. The only reason why I show so many treatment options are because there are no good treatment options. So observation with reassurance and education is probably the best thing to do. All treatment options are aimed at irritating and kicking in the body's own host defense or destructive methods. People have used tea tree oil, apple cider vinegar, brand name Zymoderm, and others including salicylic acid. You can take these off so you can numb these areas up and you can scrape them off or you can perform cryotherapy. But in the pediatric population, these are pretty traumatic for kids unless they're a really kind of good customer. And you can also put some other things on them that would make them blister up, such as, you know, the good old popular beetle juice, and use some acne meds as well. Again, all these aimed at irritating these, but what I would do is I'd leave them alone. So one good thing you can remind people is that, like the varicella, it's a pox virus. So when they go away, they should be gone. This should be a one and done disease. So should I stay or should I go? You should definitely stay. Now I can't tell you these aren't contagious. They are, but they're spread by direct contact. And I would think the best analogy would be to think of these as warts. So if you're considering taking a kiddo out of school for molluscum, you'd have to consider checking the whole school for anyone with warts and sending them all home until the warts were totally resolved, which I think most of you would probably and rightfully so, consider unreasonable. You could cover open lesions, but aside from that, these kiddos should stay in school. We're now going to move into the fungal infections. So it's important to note that there are different types of fungal infections. The ones I'm going to discuss here are dermatophytes, which are specifically a group of related fungus that digest keratin and can affect the skin, hair, and nails. These are different from candida infections, such as those commonly seen with diaper rash in young babies, and as a result, don't respond to medicines such as nystatin, such as a candidal infection would. Let's begin by talking about tinea capitis. So tinea capitis is a dermatophyte affecting the scalp. The cause is trichophyton or T. tonsorans. It's the most causative agent in the U.S. It affects mostly pre-pubertal children, and there's an increased rate of resistance in post-pubertal children. Boys get it more commonly in girls. Transmission is typically direct contact. Examination, the classic presentation would be a gradual onset of patchy alopecia hair loss with scaling, plus or minus erythema or itching. And they may have a black dot appearance, which describes the appearance of a broken hair shaft. And you might see that a little bit on this picture at the right. You see a few little black dots there, but it's not a great picture for clarity of the black dot appearance. Testing include scraping these and seeing if there's any classic findings. Management. Treatment is actually systemic because you'll need a systemic drug to penetrate the hair follicle. FDA approved treatments include griseofulvin as well as terbinafine in children greater than four years old. Griseofulvin is, ultra, is usually uh, best given as an ultra micro size, taken twice daily with milk or a fatty meal for about six to 12 weeks. And you do have to be careful of a granulocytosis with this. 
selenium sulfide shampoo may also help twice a week to decrease fungal shedding, but it doesn't kill the dermatophyte. Complications include severe presentations with evolution of a carrion, which you can see here at right, which is a fluctuant kind of red erythematous plaque, often with a crust and discharge. A carrion, it really represents an aggressive host immune response that may result in scarring alopecia at the site of infection. So this is kind of a bummer. Again, ask in the class, should I stay or should I go? The answer is you should go home for initial evaluation. It is contagious. Transmission is direct contact or contaminated fomites, brush towels, combs. And special considerations should include athletes or those wearing protective helmet gear or anything like that, someone having close head contact for any reason, or even I was thinking drama class where they might share hats or costumes. You can return to school with medical clearance or after 24 hours of initiation of appropriate therapy. The next fun one is tinea corporis, also known as ringworm, which refers to a superficial skin infection. It's also typically caused by T. tonsorans in the United States. Transmission is spread by direct contact. And on examination, you see an enlarging annular erythematous lesion with a scaly raised border with central clearing that may be itchy. The border appearance is what earned this lesion the name ringworm, but it's important to note it is not a worm whatsoever. Tests include potassium hydroxide scraping and prep, and treatments commonly used topical agents include clotrimazole, which is brand name, lotrimin, terbenafine, also known as lamisil, and tenactin. Treatment should probably be considered to seven days after the rash is cleared to ensure resolution. And some guidelines say just go ahead and treat up to two to three weeks, although I don't know if this is completely necessary. So again, to be clear, my statin will not work against these. It works against Canada, but it won't work against ringworm. You should also generally avoid steroids, as they can make disease worse and drive the infection deeper. So, should I stay or should I go? Uh, you know what? I wouldn't take a kid out of school the same day, but I'd probably have them cover it and be evaluated sometime soon. It is contagious transmissions by direct contact and you can return to school after 24 hours of initiation of treatment. You may also consider an athlete's making sure your uh, area is covered so that it is not spread. Now we're going to talk about some infestations or infections. Everyone's favorite, and probably one you know more than I do about, would be head lice, also known as pedic pediculosis capitis, it's an infestation of the scalp caused by a parasitic lice. Clinically relevant information about head lice are that they die within two to three days if they don't feed. The nymph to adult time takes about seven days. Females lay up to about eight nits per day, and they do not hop or fly. They just crawl. So people will say, oh, they're going to hop, and they jump from kid to kid, or they fly around. That is not a head louse. The burden of disease is actually quite high, and lice affect, or head lice affect, 6 to 12 million kids a year, primarily 3 to 11 years of age. They do affect girls more than boys, and Caucasians more than African Americans. Transmission is close physical contact or fomites. In examination, you'll see small yellow to white nits near the base of the hair shaft from a few to even thousands. It's important to note, too, a fun fact is that the viable eggs are within six millimeters or about a quarter inch of the scalp. You can have excoriations and kind of this eczematous type reaction from kids itching at these because they can be itchy. And speaking of itch, it's important to note that itch can last for four to six weeks even if the kid has been appropriately treated. So just because a kid is itching, you shouldn't take them out of school unless you observe more nits or live lice. An adult louse is not often seen, and sometimes there is, are as few as 10 adult louse on the scalp. 
There's no test in particular, just direct examination. And management treatments are lots. So the key to management is to treat and then retreat in about seven to nine days in most cases. And also consider treating the whole family. Over the counters include permethrin, also known as Nix, which is approved for two months and older. You leave it on the scalp for 10 minutes, but it's not ovicidal. It actually works by inhibiting the uh, sodium ion influx through the cell wall membranes causing, or cell channel membranes causing paralysis and death. Another over the counter we all know of is RID, which is approved for greater than kid, kiddos greater than two years old, but contraindicated contra during pregnancy. Again, not ovicidal. Lots of prescription medicines that be, can be given, and to briefly go over them. So ovide, which is approved for greater than two years, is ovicidal, but it's flammable. So it's important to know not to use a hair dryer or curler or straightening iron, as it is very flammable. There's also benzyl alcohol lotion, which is approved for six months and older. And it works by asphyxiating the lice by obstructing and preventing their respiratory spiracles from closing. It's also not ovicidal. And the reason it's approved for six months and over in this case is because of neonatal gasping syndrome, which can consist of severe metabolic acidosis, gasping respirations, hypotension seizure, central nervous system depression, and death in preterm or low birth weight infants. So it's one you don't want to give to young kids at all. There's a relatively new one on the market, Nutroba, which is approved for four years and older, which does contain benzyl alcohol. So again, don't use it under six months. I think it was approved by the FDA in 2011. It is pediculocidal and ovicidal, and it works by targeting the postsynaptic N-acetylcholine receptors in insects and activates voltage-gated sodium channels, leading to paralysis and death. Another old one we're probably all familiar with, ivermectin lotion or Sclice, which is approved for six months and older. In Lindane shampoo, uh, I mentioned it briefly, but the AAP does not recommend it for children as a particular side because of possible central nervous system toxicity. Non-pharmacologic treatments include laundering the bedding, hats, all these other things and knowing that lice and eggs are killed by exposure for five minutes to temperatures greater than about 120 degrees. I tell parents 130 degrees. Alternately, you can seal things in plastic bags for two weeks or have them dry cleaned. You need to comb with a fine tooth comb after treatment to remove nits. And it's said that wetting the hair with white vinegar prior to combing may or may not help loosen nits, although there's a lot of controversy surrounding this. I do not have any stock in this product, but this Lysmeister comb seems to be very popular, and all the people I work with tell me it works very well. Fortunately, I don't have any experience in that area. Should I stay or should I go? Well, you should be able to go home, be evaluated, treated, and then you should return to school. In fact, you can return to school after treatment with one anti-lice product. And both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the National Association of School Nurses recommend that all no-knit policies be abandoned. So this is one where kids should definitely be allowed to return to school fairly quickly. And last but not least, probably our least favorite, would be scabies. Scabies is a skin infection by an arachnid mite, and if by looking at this you're not itching yet, you should be. It affects co commonly young children less than five years old. Transmission is spread by direct contact or infected clothing, bedding, or other fomites. And the history is a giveaway. It's an intensely itchy rash, especially at night. In fact, where it gets its name from the Latin actually means to scratch. So you should always think about scabies when itching is keeping a kiddo up at night. And this is really gross, but the itch results from sensitization and hypersensitivity to the scabies excretions. What am I calling excretions? I mean poop. Kind of gross. 
With initial, infest with initial infection, sensitization can take, though, a week before the itch develops. But with reinfestation, if kids are reinfested, it's going to happen immediately. Exam includes papules or vesicles with a graded skin colored burrows, sometimes between the fingers, toes, wrist, groin, armpits. But infants tend to have vesicular or pustular rash, which can be on the face, head, neck, palms, and soles. For those of you who care for infants in any way or have kiddos of your own, it's important to note that the presentation is variable. So again, infants have more involvement of the extremities, face, and scalp. They're more likely to have kind of nodules uh, and might not have all the classic burrows. They're more likely to relapse in 10% may not itch, or at least initially. Tests include scraping, which may show the mite or the feces. Scabies management includes washing all bedding and clothing with hot water and using a hot dryer. Non-washables can be sealed in a plastic bag, bag for a week. And then first line, I'd use something like permethrin or elamite, which is a 5% cream applied to the whole body overnight and repeat it one week later if needed. It's safe in infants older than two months and pregnant women, although there's some worry in pregnant women about repeat exposure. Second line, uh, they note lindane as a lot of things, but it's not safe for infants, toddlers, or pregnant, so I, I would stick away from that one. And then itch control becomes very important. Again, this is a very, very itchy rash, especially at night. So use some topical steroids or maybe even antihistamines. And please note that retreatment may need to be repeated 10 to 14 days later for eradication in some case, cases. And then, not that it's very fun, but scabies fun facts. Make sure you know that alcohol hand sanitizers don't kill scabies. Another interesting fact is that mating takes place only once and leaves the female fertile for the rest of her life. That kind of stinks. So we asked the class one last time, should I stay or should I go? Go home and treat, and then return to school 24 hours after initiation of treatment. But sometimes these kiddos are worthwhile checking in on to see how they're doing, especially from the itch, because if they're up all night, their academic performance may suffer and you may have them see their primary care or friendly neighborhood dermatologist for some additional help with itch control and resolution. So that brings us towards the end of our lecture and our time together today. But to review, just a few key takeaway points. So considering bacterial infections, we kind of used, or kind of use impetigo as your, let's say your flagship disease, knowing that it's caused by staph or strep. Um, and the takeaway points I would emphasize is that when you do treat to decrease colonization, especially in a kid who has repetitive empatigo, it might be helpful to ask, is treatment including the nose? And dilute bleach baths can really help with colonization. All the other subsequent eczema and uh, deeper abscesses and cellulose, you can really use empatigo as your jumping off point and understand those diseases from there. Considering the viral infection, both uh, erythema infectiosum, known as slap cheek, and molluscum contagiosum, it's important to note that if you have the classic erythema infectiosum, infectiosum rash on the cheeks, these kids can stay at school. They often get sent home, but it's OK for them to stay. And if you have molluscum contagiosum, you should consider these like warts. So don't send all these kids home unless you think they're secondarily infected, infected with something like impetigo, because you're going to keep them out for six to nine months or two years if you really want those little, little guys gone before letting them come back. Looking at the fungal infections, we talked about the dermatophytes, tinea capitis and corporis. And just know in your head that tinea capitis takes a long time to treat, so it's not going to be gone instantaneously. And then with tinea corporis on the body, you really need to be careful about suggesting steroids, as steroids are going to drive this infection deeper and often make it much worse and more widespread. And then everyone's fa favorite, the infestations and infections, so talking about lice. And again, I can't emphasize enough that uh, no-net policies should be abandoned. 
And then with scabies, keep in mind that scabies is very itchy, and it's very itchy at night, so it often affects kids' sleep and their school per performance. Nathan, thank you for lending your expertise, and thank you to our listeners for participating with this online training. As a reminder, this is the first training in the five-part series. If you have any questions regarding this training or any future training, please contact the Pro Wellness Center, and our email is on the screen. Thank you again, and have a great day.